helps unpack the Christian faith. Um, we're focusing today on, I believe in Jesus Christ, uh, his only son, our Lord. And earlier, um, Deb led us through a couple of question and answer from the catechism, uh, its explanation of those, those lines. Um, but the catechism itself certainly leans on the scriptures, and that's what we want to do as well. Um, and so we'll look first at Mark chapter 1. And before we do so, would you pray with me? We pray with the psalmist, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Amen. So we're looking at uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the, for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in the desert forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. And then I invite you to turn ahead to, to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. Do we have that overhead, Jody? Okay. 1 Corinthians uh, 12, verse uh, 4 through um, 11. Paul writes, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all people. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one, of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. So for those that have grown up in the church, and in particular a, a Reformed church, uh, hearing about Jesus as prophet, priest, and king might be somewhat familiar. Um, so maybe you scarcely bat an eye at this terminology, Jesus as prophet, priest, and king, when the catechism uses these terms, even as we read it earlier. But for some of us who are maybe not marinated in kind of reformed language, uh, these words might kind of strike you as odd and even mysterious. And I think we would all do well to reflect on what these titles even mean. Uh, for one, what do you think about? What comes to mind when you hear the word prophet? Um, one fellow got a sign that says, the end is Thursday, amateur the end is near. And uh, I put that up there because there's lots of different ways to um, portray uh, modern-day prophets. Uh, this is relatively positive. Truth be told, 
uh, many of us, at least you know, when we look around in our culture, we often think prophets are kind of loopy folks, right? Holding signs, proclaiming things like the end is near. That's one of the pictures that comes to us, maybe not from within the church, but from without, of, uh, of prophecy. But if prophecy is, uh, is a bit odd, the word priest brings together uh, probably even stronger emotions. Um, and what does your wife think of your vow? Father Brian was fairly sure he would need to explain celibacy to the journalist one more time. Um, I put that up there because, again, you know, in our culture, this is pretty tame when it comes to how society views and associates priests. There's a lot of scandal and, sadly, a lot of abuse that get associated with even that term, right? Priests today are not automatically associated with sacrifices that can bring us closer to God. Uh, instead, that word priest is, is viewed with a lot of skepticism in our society today. And, and so to, to the, the term king, um, it's pretty loaded in our day and age, right? We, from a recent visit of the royals, um, we've maybe even had to consider what it means to have a king or a queen. I mean, some hear that terminology and, and are reminded of a monarchy in our own culture, which is maybe um, technically part of our government, uh, but sometimes it seems like it is mere window dressing. And what's that mean? And, or even we hear of monarchy in our modern day, and we think of modern day kings and queens around the world who have failed in their offices to... Uh, to be um, gracious and to be truthful, to, to love justice and to seek mercy, to walk humbly with God. And, and all this to say that those terms of prophet, priest, and king uh, sometimes fail to connect, or they, they connect, but they connect in totally the wrong ways. And so we want to look a little bit this morning at, at these, imp- which I think are very important titles in the catechism, uh, uh, thinks are important titles, and, and, and we want to recover them, not just for the sake of the terms, but because they help us better explain who Jesus is and, and why we love him so much so as to even show up here together on a Sunday morning. Uh, the Catechism itself uh, was published way back in 1563, and uh, I think it's a pretty radical teaching. Um, when it first came out, the catechism, uh, when it first came out, the church scene was dominated by the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, there is the clergy, who are all priests, male priests. But then there's also the, the laity, who is the rest of the people. And, but here comes along the, the radical Heidelberg Catechism. And it dares to announce that every single genuine believer is a priest in Christ. Both male and female. Both older and younger. Right. So just imagine that. Imagine a church that is full of priests. It's a pretty radical thought uh, in 1563. But it really it doesn't stop there. Right? In the 16th century, there is also a certain group of prophets called the Zwickau Prophets. And they did not have a particularly good reputation. They were known in German as Die Schwarmer. I don't really know how to pronounce it, but I, it's how it's, uh, which means radical enthusiasts, right? But now, here comes along the catechism, and it says, not only do we have these few priests of Zwickau, but we have a few prophets of Zwickau, but we have a whole church that's full of prophets. And so the, the catechism comes along and it kind of out-radicalizes the radical. And to top it all off, the catechism um, was so audacious so as to affirm that, that those who truly believe in Christ are kings and queens. They are real royalty. Now, in 1563 in Germany, there were a good number of princes. Uh, they even had an emperor, Ferdinand I, and, and it was clear, uh, both by clothing and social standing, who did and who did not belong to the royal class. Right? And so the catechism come along, comes along, and, and, and it's actually saying that, that every peasant, uh, every Hans, Peter, and Klaus, right, was in some sense a king. 
And could the princes tolerate such a thought? Right? Could the peasants even wrap their minds around such teaching? And this is radical for the 16th century. But it's not only radical for the 16th century. The same is true, I think, of the 21st century. Because if we're honest, I think, you know, how many of us go about our daily duties walking and talking as prophets, priests, and kings and queens in Christ? I mean, is that even something we consciously consider? Is, is that something that we act upon? Or is the catechism too radical even for us today? The catechism comes along and it reminds us that this term Christ means something. It means something very important. Uh, the term Christ often gets kind of misunderstood or overlooked, right? When we refer to Jesus Christ, lots of people think, seem to think that Jesus Christ is like saying John Smith, right? Whereas Christ is somehow Jesus' last name, right? We forget that Christ is, first of all, a title. Saying Christ Jesus uh, is a title like President is a title, President Obama, or like Prime Minister is a title, Prime Minister Trudeau, right? Christ means anointed, anointed one. And, and the, the Greek version uh, of this is, uh, is Christ, but the Hebrew is Messiah. And in the ancient world, to be anointed was what today we might describe as being ordained or, or kind of set aside for a specific task. And so an anointing is kind of like an inauguration or a swearing in, some, some sort of a commissioning in which somebody is, is vested with a certain amount of authority to carry out some pretty specific assignments. Now, in the case of Jesus as God's anointed Christ, the, this traditional triple designation that goes along with this um, are the offices of prophet, priest, and king. And, and all three of those offices, right, were ones that required anointing in ancient Israel, right? So, but back then, a, a person was either a prophet, or they were a priest, or they were a king. They, 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 nobody was ever all three of these, right? Just like in our government structure, I don't think anybody could be the prime minister and the Supreme Court justice and, and a senator. They couldn't be all those things at the same time. But because Jesus is God's very own son, uh, the Christian tradition tells us that, that Christ, in Christ, all these, all these offices um, combine perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus himself is anointed, he's, he's a prophet. And a prophet is a teacher, and so Jesus is the perfect instructor to teach us about God's nature and God's purpose and, and his truth. And, and Jesus is the one that revealed most clearly, both by what he said and by what he did, he, he revealed to us what God's like, his character, uh, what, what his purposes were for in salvation, and what his will is for uh, in our lives. But not only is he a prophet, Jesus is also anointed as a priest. right? And a priest is a, is a go-between who, who brings God and his people back together. Right? He rejoins them. And so Israel, uh, the priest, right? Sorry, in, in, in Israel, in ancient Israel, the priest did that by doing what? By sacrificing animals. Right, to symbolize that, that forgiveness always costs something. It always costs blood. Right? But as a priest, Jesus does something even more marvelous. Right? He does something more incredible than just offer sacrifices outside of himself. Jesus himself is the sacrifice. Right? That's one of the most perfect and incredible things about Jesus fulfilling this role. And because he lays himself down, we know that our sins will always be forgiven. And then the final office is Jesus anointed as king. And a king guides the people, right? A king sets policy on how life should go, protects the people, uh, secures true freedom, a space where they can thrive, right? And we see that Jesus is the ultimate king. He orders life. Uh, uh, the, he orders the life of his people through, the, through his revealed law. And so in short, Jesus as prophet and priest and as king in him, we have all that we need to thrive. But there's one more thing that we're told that I think is pretty stunning here in, uh, in this Lord's Day 12. Basically, we're told 
that we are anointed to. That every believer, through the Holy Spirit, is to minister to others 